Good afternoon, friends. Welcome to Escambia Citizens Watch Live once again. I'm John Singley, your host today, and we're going to continue our series about the trees, for the love of trees, balancing growth. Today we have the voice of the development, a voice of the development community, Fred Himmer of Himmer Consulting. And we thought it was important to hear from the development community as the county begins its review of their tree ordinance. So Fred, thank you for coming in today. Thank you, John. Pleasure to be here. Tell us a little bit about your background, Fred, for those of you who've never met you before and how you wound up here in Pensacola as a, as a developer and a citizen. Sure. My background is CPA from St. Petersburg, Florida. Been in the business world down there you know, most of my life. Uh, worked for a very prominent developer, doing all sorts of development, banking, been on the board of a bank for 30 years. And in 2010, I was uh, asked to come up here by a friend who had acquired some assets through his bank and was looking to dispose of them. And so in 2010, I came up, made my first visit, uh, came up here on a regular basis for several years, and in 2014, ended up making this my permanent home. So my my wife and I both live here in a home in the East Hill area, and we ended up buying several of the projects that the banker had offered to us. Uh, ended up developing several big subdivisions and acquired the big parcel up in Cantonment. So we are here. Well, great. And, um, it, you know, the development community um, is obviously has an interest in uh, trees. Uh, trees are an amenity to any development. It's how we deal with the trees. Uh, uh, many people have said that when the developers start, uh, they may or may not be sensitive to the value that the tree brings to the real estate. So if you're watching today and have any questions for Fred, uh, put them on your Facebook comments and we'll get them over to him. So Fred, uh, talk about how a developer sees trees. Well, we see trees as an asset. Um, you know, there, there are certain trees that are better quality than, than other trees, and those high-quality trees, specifically the larger oak trees, we do whatever we can to save them. And we've gone, in certain cases, great lengths to save them. It's hard to put a value on, you know, on a financial project, what, what difference it makes, and so we really don't care about that. But we just know that if we try to save these trees, that it just makes our project look better and is, is better for, you know, the residents. We... Um, we think that the ordinance that's suggesting to you know, restrict certain things, um, we don't see that as the right way to go here. We, we think there's enough incentives and things that could be done to promote the saving of these trees by the uh, developer world and by the home builders, and uh, we'd like to see that uh, continue. Let's talk about incentives. Give us an example of an incentive you think would be useful for both the the development community and uh, then the home builders and the home buyers. Sure, well, you know, there may be situations where there are trees that could be taken down that uh, we don't take down. And you know, maybe what could happen here is that the staff could give us credit in another area that maybe where you were forced to take a tree down because of its location or something there that was blocking that. But, you know, certainly incentives could be put in place to help, you know, promote the saving of those larger trees. Yeah, I, will I once lived in a community that passed a sweeping uh, beautification ordinance that was resisted by just about the entire business community there, but the way they finally got it done was the city council created uh, incentives, tax incentives, and grandfathering clauses that allowed uh, existing businesses to spend money to come up to beautificate the new beautification code and get a tax credit for it. And I think 20 years later, that community is a sparkling example of, of how they, a community can better itself. I, I think that's what I hear you saying, perhaps. It, absolutely. You know, one, one of the things that we do as far as our whole tree management program is in all of our subdivisions, we have required that all the lots, if they did not have an oak tree already there that was there when they built, that they had to plant a grade A live oak tree in that yard. We monitor, monitor that carefully, but the, the idea is, you know, you think 10, 15 years from now, what any given street will look like when those trees have grown up. I mean, it, 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 it makes a whole difference in the, the quality and the look of that subdivision. It becomes a treed subdivision again. So, development, 
unfortunately requires the removal of trees from time to time, it just does. But at the same time, if you're responsible, you save all those trees that you can, you either go out of your way to save some of the better ones, and at the same time require a replanting uh, schedule, I think that helps mitigate the damage by taking down a few of these select trees. Um, you had mentioned earlier that um, the developers share the same values. Talk a little bit more about that, Fred. Well, they, sh they should say, share the same values. Um, you know, we just think that a subdivision that is heavily treed is worth more. It's worth more to the resident. Whether the builder who buys lots from us realizes that, we don't know. Um, again, we're, we're more concerned with having a subdivision that we're done, we're proud of, and that 10 years, 15 years from now, those residents that live there are happy that they live there. If you're just joining us this afternoon or this evening, or yeah, live this afternoon, and uh, you've, um, you've got questions for Fred Himmer, who's speaking for himself as a developer in, as the county undergoes this tree ordinance review, please put your questions on the, your Facebook comments. We'll try to get them over to Fred. You just mentioned something that I think is important to many of us, Fred, is the distinction between a developer and a builder. Would you kind of unpack that a little bit for the average viewer? Sure. My role as a developer, you know, we, we buy the land, we go in, we look at the, the zoning, we hire engineers, surveyors, we try to plan what is the best you know, development for that land. Uh, we are the ones that are establishing the ground rules for that development. Uh, in the cases where we've done projects here, we've established pretty strict homeowner covenants that run with the land and they keep the builders from doing what they want. We are controlling what those builders do. Um, that's different from uh, a subdivision where there are no covenants and the builders just buy the lots and then they're able to just do on that lot whatever the county code allows. In our case, we have you know, restrictions beyond what the county code provides. So we want to control our subdivision. So you um, talked about how uh, careful uh, protection of the trees when you're developing land for resale to builders can enhance the value of the of the homes that would be built there on the property uh, and you brought some examples to show us today would you share some of them with us sure no i'd like to yeah i, I just i took some pictures on some things that um some specific things that we've done that shows what can be done to help save trees this this first picture that is up that specific tree, um, that road that you see right below to the right, that road was about, I don't know, maybe up to 10 feet further closer to the tree, which was the original design that our engineers, the county engineers, everybody approved. The idea is we were saving that tree. But when our contractor got in there, and he knew the importance of, of saving that tree, but when our contractor started cutting the road, we realized there was a main root coming off that tree that would have been problematic to cut through and the utilities going through there. So we literally stopped construction. Engineers went back, went back to the county. We re-engineered, we moved the road over to get away from that route line and redid the road. So, you know, that, that cost time and money and effort, but we saved a beautiful tree. And when you look down that street, you know, from yeah. the boulevard turn in there, it looks gorgeous. You know, it was worth doing that and it provides a nice canopy for people driving under there. So that is a tree that would have been gone had the original plans, you know, been executed. Here's another interesting thing that we did. Um, it may be hard to see in the picture, but in the background, that's a retention pond. In the foreground, we have a separate retention pond. If you can see in between those two retention ponds, to the left of where that wooden fence is, there's an oak tree there. We could have connected those two retention ponds and taken that oak tree out. But in talking with our, our engineer and talking with our land planner, we came up, they came up with the idea of, of still berming it, but if you can see, we have an inlet that drains the one retention pond into the other retention pond. So we were able to save that oak tree by that design method.
Here's an example of our subdivision. Uh, it was adjacent to another subdivision. The plans called for a storm sewer pipe to be run underground right along next to those oak trees. Again, when the contractor got in there and started digging the trench, we realized that too many of those roots coming from those oak trees ran into our lots. So again, we stopped, we moved that pipe I think it was about 10 feet further away to get outside those roots. We had to re-engineer the, you know, the lot configurations, the setbacks, it changed the requirements on the builders. By the way, the, this was under contract to a national builder and they agreed with all these changes that we made you know, to, to help save these oaks. So we saved this whole line of oak trees, which was beneficial not only to us, but to the subdivision next door. Right, so a lot of flexibility is involved and you uh, working with the county and the builders and the engineers, you can find a solution that uh, can protect the trees in many cases. In many cases, in some cases you can't. Yeah. You know, I mean, in some cases you may have a, a, a tree that is just in the wrong location. It may be where you want a, a retention pond or the, na the, the, the most sensible place for a retention pond. In some cases, that may result in loss of a tree, but maybe because you put that retention pond there, you save two or three other trees. So, you know, we, we look at it as an overall tree management plan for the whole area. Okay, yeah, as, a, well, as opposed to sort of an individual tree by tree thing, it's the sum total of the project. Huh? Correct. Yeah. Now, what you're looking at here, this, this was a stand of oak trees, and I'm not sure how many of them would be classified as heritage oaks, but they certainly were beautiful old oak trees and there there must I don't even know how many two three dozen of them in there. there there's more outside this picture when we did the planning for this we could have taken down all those trees we could have put lots in there we worked with the home builder that we were delivering the lots for and we said no we want to save these trees it just did not make sense to take these trees down a lot of this property that we bought for this subdivision was already clear-cut there wasn't a tree on the property but then you came down to the stand of oaks and we said, no, we're gonna save that. So we designed this so that uh, there was retention done on the outside of these trees so that it did not affect the natural drainage that would be detrimental to the trees. We also created a permanent park for the residents so that those trees will never come down. So when this project is done, it will be cleaned up and there'll be you know, places for the residents to go in there. But there was a case where we said, the value of that amenity offset, you know, the, the damage of taking those trees down. It would have been a crime to take those down. And where, where is, was this uh, located? This, is, this is in Beulah. Beulah? Yeah, okay. This is in Beulah. And this is just another angle of, of those same trees. And again, another angle showing the retention ponds incorporated around the, the outside of those. And then... Wow, it, this is a nice, uh, nice bucolic-looking lake. Uh, where would this be? This is the same project. Now, this is taken from that stand of trees, shooting towards this lake that is on the property. And what we did there is those trees that are on the other side of that lake, they're on uplands that could have been developed, or at a minimum, we could have sold that land to the people that have the homes on the other side of those trees. We did not, we put them in a permanent conservation area with the lake and made that part of the uh, you know, amenity to the homeowners. And then what will happen is they're gonna end up having a walkway through those trees. But again, it's a method of, you know, by putting things in a conservation area, you can save you know, a lot of things. And we think significantly increase the value to those homeowners. You're, uh, if you're just joining with us, we have Fred Himmer, a Himmer uh, Consulting Company. He's speaking uh, as a representative of the development community in our series, For the Love of Trees, Balancing Growth. Fred, uh, talk a little bit more. You've got a few more pictures in there, perhaps? No, that, uh, that, that runs that's through. the last one. Yeah. Well, this, uh, this looks like, the, this last picture with the lake looks like a place that I'd like to live. I mean, this looks like a... A desirable place. Oh, I mean, it's a it's a beautiful lake, and there's quite a few fish in there. Yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty. And I think you know one thing to notice from this picture, you see no clay in that lake, and you see there's that black fence burned in there. With all the work that's been done on this property, there's been extensive silt fencing and things to, to, to 
that the contractor has kept any of that from flowing into that lake. Right, and the and the barrier looks intact. Does it look it, blown down and ripped and no. flapping in the wind? It's no, uh, but but barriers are constant maintenance. <laughs> you get enough storms, they'll be blowing yeah. in the wind, and they got to be replaced. Well, um, this has been very enlightening. Um, a lot of people uh, have said, Fred, to us that. Um, Developers really just want to clear cut and start from scratch and plant a few trees, some new trees here, there, and everywhere. What do you say to people uh, who express that kind of thought about the development world? Well, you may have said it already, but yeah, let's I think say they, it again. Well, I know? just think they need to think longer term. That you know, these trees, they're an asset to the community. All the communities look better when they have you know majestic trees like that in there. And I think people need to recognize those value. And I think that there's there's things that uh, could be done at the staff level that would help encourage the developers to save these trees and do the right thing. You know, it's, it's not that costly. You know, I hear that you know a lot of developers get criticized for clear cutting. You got to realize that in some of the places where they clear cut, clear cutting was the right answer. You know, if you had a piece of property that was timbered ten years ago and nobody replanted, well, you just have a lot of poor quality scrub oaks or palmettos and things that have grown up there, there's no redeeming value to those, you know, in a, in a development, then the clear cut is the right answer. You know, I've read some things where people saying that some of the developers have clear cut wetlands. I don't think that's <laughs> happened. If, if Show me somebody's clear cut a wetland and they're going to jail. You know, yeah. you know we, we may have to ask for Dealing with some of the wetlands and encroaching on some of them because you had to get access to a different area, but then you mitigate for that. You know, we we spend a lot of time with the various water management districts and the Army Corps of Engineers negotiating these things. You know, in this case with this lake, we came with an overall plan because we knew that we were going to be snipping some a couple of wet areas, and we said this overall plan far exceeds any of the damage we did to a few areas, and it's been widely agreed that that was the case and so this was a, an easy approval well um, we've learned an awful lot today about um, the how do you balance growth and development which is inevitable with uh, our love of trees all of us love trees in various forms and shapes and Fred that's been interesting uh, uh, but I'm, I'm going to ask you a question here on the back end of this discussion sure. about um, Development at large, uh, one of the things we hear on social media is we're overbuilding this area, uh, there's too much in this area, there's not enough in this area. What does the market look like through your eyes uh, for the next 10 years or so? I mean, given your crystal ball is any clearer than ours, what do you see here? Well, are you yeah, bullish? You, oh, we're, well. We own 1,500 acres of land in Kentomet that we are taking through the entitlement <laughs> process and working with uh, the road infrastructure on the sector plan. So yes, we're very bullish and uh, very invested in, in this. So uh, here's what I see happening. When you look at, at the continued growth, there's a lot of infill still to be done, you know, in the Beulah area and in between the Beulah area, you know, going north. Uh, when you look at the shape of Escambia County, you know, you're We've got water on the left, we've got water on the right, the county gets thin in the middle before it opens back up. So this, this growth has to go there. You know, 10 years or more when the, you know, the commissioners and planners were working on that area and they came up with a sector plan, 15,000 acres, and they tried to come up with a logical development plan, a road network and zoning and the type of things that need to be done to properly have a master plan to follow. And we are we're involved in that and we see that, that that is just the way it's going to go. Our first project up there at 29 and uh, Quintet, uh, we're well on the way to getting that permit process done and that is under contract. You look on Quintet Road further to the east, um, the Lakes of Carrington was sold out and Thomas Henry's building a new project right next to that. That's the location of the Home Builder Association Parade of Homes this year. So the market is there. What, what is gonna happen, I think, is that the market is gonna get up to that area before the internal road networks get up there. The, the plan was for the interchange of Beulah to be built and then the Woodlands Parkway run from the interchange up north 
until it hits up into the uh, you know northern part of uh, 29. The we'll we'll see how fast that happens, but I'm pretty confident that we are going to be having homes built in our area is going to be built in excess or, or faster than when the interchange in the Woodlands Parkway in the south end is built. You think that the sector plan uh, provides enough guidance and enough uh, uh, master planning for developers and property owners. There's some who've suggested that the county is so diverse now that the northern county is rural, the southern county um, south of Nine Mile Road perhaps is much more urban and there's two different sets of challenges and opportunities involved. Is it, do you see the same thing? I mean, do, do our current uh, sector planning and zoning um, being one size fits all, does it, does it adequate for the future? Well, I'm not, I don't know. Um, yeah, I can tell you what was done. It was done with a combination of trying to create density and maintain green space and other, you know, environmentally sensitive places. I can tell you going through the, the work we are with our first project, there's a lot of extra expenses going through mapping out these wetlands, doing all the things that we need to do to comply with the requirements under the sector plan, which exceed the requirements of the rest of the county. There is a, an overlay, it's, the acronym is DSAP, that has requirements for development that exceed the requirements from the county. And that is uh, something that we must do and that we're doing in those first subdivisions. You know, one of, one of the things that the whole sector plan is talking about is creating you know, various intermodal transportation opportunities. And that is part of all of these plans. You've got increased sidewalks, increased bike paths, things that you don't have in the rest of the county, and including the requirements for new trees on each lot. That's also in, this, uh, in these requirements up there. Well, Fred, we're uh, on the back end of what's been a very interesting conversation this afternoon. You have provided one bookend to our series for the love of trees balancing growth. And, and I think by coming over here today uh, to provide your perspective, you've given this series a very balanced look at the questions that come before all of us uh, as we consider revisions to the, to the tree ordinances or uh, anything else having to do with land planning. So in closing, is there any last, uh, anything you want to say uh, as we uh, finish up here? No, any final thoughts? Trees are good. Try to save the good trees. Try to save the quality trees. Well, I got and, one for you. Okay. What the heck happened to the Tampa Bay Lightning? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, that I is a sore point. Yeah, so, so we <laughs> all have our favorite hockey teams, many of us, and the Tampa Bay Lightning uh, just amazed all of us this year. And we were so excited, and we went back and forth to watch the hockey, and then all of a sudden comes the playoffs last week, and they got bulldozed. I mean, they just vaporized into thin air, and now it's just a memory. Four in a row and it's over. Yeah, so... Uh, Go Tampa Bay Rays. Yeah, the it's Rays, baseball. all the way to the World Series. Okay, well, th Fred, thank you very much. Thank Fred you. Himmer of Himmer Consulting, our guest this afternoon. And thank all of you, friends, for joining with us. And until next time, John Singley and Teresa Hill back behind the cameras and everything and all of our guests in here. We have studio guests this afternoon. So um, thank you once again and uh, join us again here tomorrow afternoon when uh, we uh, take another look at the mayor's transition report with uh, a good friend of all of ours, Michelle Saltzman. So until then, John Singley and Fred saying, uh, have a great afternoon and evening, and whenever you watch this, enjoy what you see. Thank you. Thanks, John.